Hello and welcome to the Burn KC Sportscast. I am your host, Alex Blackburn, here to bring you the good KC Sports news. Now, we've got a decent sized show up ahead. I'm going to go over transfer and recruiting stuff for college basketball. Uh, kind of the same thing with college football, too, uh, except I'm going to go over spring practices as well. Um, got a bit of Royals news. Uh, if you haven't been paying attention, they've actually been doing pretty well, but there are concerns that I want to go over with this team. Uh, got draft week. NFL draft is this coming Thursday. Uh, so we'll be talking about that for sure. And we've got a little bit of soccer to go over, but other than that, that's it. So strap in, sit tight, and let's just get this thing started. Should be a good show coming up for you. So let's just get started. All right, let's start with college basketball here. I've uh, got a little bit of news regarding the transfer portal as well as um, just recruiting stuff. Um, let's start with Kansas, though. Let's 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 get into them a little bit. So Kansas has been hot on the recruiting trail as far as transfers go. Um, obviously, you know we talked about Riley Kugel uh, this past weekend or this past sportscast, um, and he was pretty much the only recruit. Um, thus far in Kansas' repertoire. I I may have talked about Zeke Mayo. Zeke Mayo may have signed the day before I released that Scorchcast. I can't remember for the life of me. But not too long after that, Zeke Mayo, the sharpshooter from South Dakota State, and Lawrence Native as well, uh, committed to play for KU. And now Kansas has bolstered their recruiting class in as far as transfer portal goes even further with the commitment of former Wisconsin guard AJ Store. Um, AJ Store is expected to be kind of the Johnny Furphy replacement. Um, he's expected to be, you know, the sharpshooter that can drive it inside and you know, has that innate ability to score, and he really does. I mean, he's the pl- probably going to be the best play creator out of that KU basketball roster coming th- this next coming year. Um, I do know that KU is still pursuing multiple other options. Uh, Rylan Griffin, the transfer from Alabama, is a big name to watch for. Um, we also have word of, uh, Josh Brea. Um, he's out of Dayton and he's another name to potentially watch for. Um, other than that, you know, there's a couple names that have been thrown around, but those are the two Brea and, um, and Griffin that are the two big ones that KU is keeping their eye on. So stay tuned for further updates regarding that. Uh, KU hot on the recruiting trail for transfers, uh, which is understandable given, you know, Bill's promise to look ahead to next year and to overcorrect from last year's really disappointing squad. So good on him for making due on his promise. Let's hope that, you know, KU can get back to being KU. Uh, because last year was just not KU's best year. It was arguably the worst year in the self era. So it would be nice to have good KU basketball again, considering that is the closest thing we have to an NBA team around here in Kansas City. And they're just really fun to watch when they're good. So, and that's, you know, coming from a KU fan and alum. So take that with a grain of salt, Missouri and K State fans. You guys are sometimes fun to watch too. Uh, But speaking of which, Mizzou just picked up a big-time recruit, former Duke player, Mark Mitchell, and I believe he's a St. Louis native, if I remember right, uh, has committed to play for the Tigers, and that is coming off of one of the worst seasons of Missouri Tiger basketball in a very long time, so that's that's big for them. That's huge for them, actually. Um, 
I think they got a couple more transfers. Let me check 247 Sports real quick. I don't believe really any anybody more of note than Mark Mitchell, though. I mean, Mark Mitchell was a mainstay in that Kate in that uh that Duke offense and overall is going to really help the Tigers. Uh let me pull up their stuff real quick. Yep. Missouri basketball transfer tracker. So, Tony Perkins, Marquise Warwick, and Mark Mitchell have all committed to Missouri within the span of a week. And then they got their eye on Terrace Reed for a potential home- homecoming. Um, John Tonji uh, entered the transfer portal, which, I mean, was not surprising. Uh, and then Jordan Butler also left. Um, so, you know, they have... They have openings at Missouri, and they're they're filling them quick as people are lose as people are leaving quick too. Um, some names to watch for Missouri are Bent Lukden. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. He's a UC Irvine guy, um, and then Ohio State's Felix Okpara. Um, yeah, and then the brother of Michael Porter. Uh, Javon Porter committed this afternoon. I forget who he committed for. It wasn't Missouri, though. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, Missouri's doing work in the portal as they should because they they're really struggling. So um, definitely good on them for you know, trying to make Dennis Gates' third year a little easier and a less of a hill to climb than last year, for sure. Um, and then other than that, I mean, K-State K- really hasn't done a whole lot. Uh, I can check their 247 page real quick to see if I'm missing anything. But, I mean, overall, K-State has not done too much, which is kind of a surprise um, because they're missing quite a few pieces from the transfer portal. Um, let me make sure that I didn't miss like a signing or something. Um, they got a three star transfer from Illinois, Chicago, and then I already talked about Doug McDaniel, so that's a big one. Uh, Drell Colbert's gone, Cam Carter's gone, Dorian Finster's gone, Cam Carter. Oh, yeah, Cam Carter. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, just not a whole lot of movement from the K-State camp uh, as far as signing transfers. I mean, they got Doug McDaniel. Doug McDaniel's probably ranked in the top 10 as far as top transfers go, um, which is a good good pickup. But I I anticipate there will be more from the K State camp because honestly, if there isn't, I I would definitely put that into question as to you know what exactly is going on in that camp um, for transfer recruits to stay away because that should be a hotbed right now. They they got a ton of scholarships open, um, a bunch of guys just left, you know. Jerome, Jerome Tang has rebuilding to do, and he's he's got to get on the recruiting trail before you know it ends up like this past year. Um, let's go ahead and get some into some uh, college football, shall we? Um, like I said, not too much going on uh, with college basketball, but college football it's about the same. But again, warrants its own section, so let's jump right in. All right, let's jump on into college football. First and foremost, I want to make an announcement. I was officially named the Big 12 lead national columnist for college football dogs. Um, I know this is recorded, so I don't expect you guys to clap. But if you're watching, clap, please. 
Thank you. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing a lot more Big 12-centered writing, um, which could trickle over. Um, I still plan on just covering KU, K-State, and Mizzou uh, with this channel, um, but it could trickle over. I'm not sure. I know that, you know, we have Iowa State fans here, Oklahoma fans, um, and just random Big 12 people, um, and Nebraska fans, too. Uh, shout out to Coach Pearson. But overall, um, I will be covering Big 12 schools for college football dogs. So exciting times. Uh, be on the lookout for some Big 12 football articles coming your way. Uh, as far as the local teams go, KU had their spring, excuse me, their spring showcase, uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before. Uh, showcased a lot of depth. They've got um quite a quite a bit more depth than a lot of people were thinking. There's still some spots that you know will need filling. Um, but overall, they 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 look like a good team this year, and they look like a team that's going to pursue a Big Twelve title. Um, as far as you know, Jalen Daniels' situation goes, uh, he looked healthy as a horse. So, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't worry or read too much into that situation. Uh, it's looking pretty good from my end and from the end of multiple KU insiders. So I fully expect him to play um, this upcoming fall. And, you know, his health is a concern, yes, but it's not the biggest concern for KU football, in my opinion. I think that really belongs to kind of where the linebacking core is going to be at come the fall and then where the offensive line is going to be at come fall. Um, you know, and with the offensive line, it's just a matter of who who starts is essentially where it is because they have a ton of depth at that position. Uh, they just have a new line coach that – needs to fit a lot of experienced bodies into where they're going to play the best or, you know, be their best selves. So that's kind of the conundrum that they have there. As far as linebacking goes, there's just not the numbers for it. I think KU needs to go portaling to grow, grab at least one or two more linebackers, um, maybe a defensive lineman too. I know that, you know, the pass rush lost a couple of really key guys in Austin Pug in Austin Booker um, and, you know, Gage Keys. Um, but from what I saw at the spring showcase or of the spring showcase, uh, KU, KU has a great pass rush still. I mean, even without Booker and Keys. Um, to add icing on the cake, I think would be nice. But overall, I, I think the KU defensive line is going to survive whether they add a piece or not. The linebacking core, however, I really would like to see KU add at least one more piece there. Um, let's, let's jump on over to K-State. K-State does not have a spring game. Um, it's just something that coach Chris Clemen does. Um, doesn't have a spring game, just has spring practices, but no spring game. Um, so I've been kind of keeping an eye on their practices. Um, Avery Johnson so far looks as advertised. I mean, he's a great player. I think he's got a really good future ahead of him. Um, they want to see him bulk up a bit because he's still like a buck 80, but I mean, if, if, if Will Howard is any indication, uh, as far as, you know, what K K state athletics can do for a guy, um, specifically the athletic training program. I think Johnson should have no problem bulking up. Um, as far as like the wide receiver situation goes, I think they have the bodies for it. Uh, they've got a couple of good transfers and good, um, recruits coming in. Uh, I know that there was a main worry with the loss of Philip Brooks. Um, 
I think he, he might still be with the team, actually. I'm, I apologize. I'm not sure. Actually, no, he's not. He's not. Sorry. My brain is all over the place. I just got off work. So, <laughs> um, but they do have bodies like Garcia. Uh, they have, oh, who else do they have? They've got a couple more guys. Um, Jesus. But yeah, just um, there's yeah there's there's quite a few uh, status of linebacker Jake Clifton. Yeah, Jake Clifton, uh, I believe is hurt. Yeah, they got Cephas still. Um, ah, uh, yeah, Clifton. Could be leaving due to religious obligation. Uh, I'm not sure what religious obligation, but there's that. Um, and yeah, they 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 got they got a solid wide receiver room. Um, as far as their other positions, they're still going to be strong on defense. Uh, they've got you know a lot of depth at defense. Uh, really the weakness there is their secondary and they've been doing the work to kind of bolster that a little bit um, work that I'd like to see done to the KU linebacking core. Um, but overall, it should be another really thrilling contest between KU and K-State when they, when they play again. Um, and, you know, unfortunately with, um, with K-State, there is some pretty tragic news. Um, former K-State offensive guard, or excuse me, tackle, um, and her Mill Valley coach, uh, Terrell Johnson, passed away at age 29 this week. Um, my thoughts and prayers are with him and his family, uh, with Mill Valley, with Kansas State, uh, just to utterly heartbreaking loss i mean he was a football coach for for mill valley was an influence on young minds everywhere um and just way way too young um so i shared the gofundme uh for his uh, post-death expenses um that his family's gonna have to deal with um i shared that on my twitter uh, so go check it out. Donate if you can. If not, then share it. Um, you know, if you if you don't have the money to donate, it's always a great thing to share something that you see. Um, so my thoughts and prayers are with Mr. Johnson's family. Uh, may he rest in peace. And yeah, just not not fun news at all. Um, yeah. So anyway, on to Mizzou. Uh I haven't really heard much from Mizzou since March. <laughs> I mean that's that's when they had their spring games. So it's it's it, I mean, Mizzou looks like they're gonna compete for an SEC title again. Um it's gonna be tough. I think they have kind of a an uphill battle um to win the conference this year. I mean, obviously it's the SEC, so it's it's really tough. Um they did end up have they did end up having a wide receiver transfer, uh Danis Jackson. Whoever that is, <laughs> he's a he's a three star transfer. Um, so, you know, he, he could definitely be a benefit to someone. Um, but yeah, just other than that, Missouri really hasn't done a whole lot. Their wide receiver core should be as advertised again. Uh, Brady Cook coming back for another year. Uh, really all they got to work on is their losses in their secondary. And, you know, they don't really have that much of an LB presence anymore either. So uh, maybe working on those um, would be to their benefit. But I mean, 
it's still the Missouri Tigers team from last year, to be honest. I mean, they, they really haven't lost a whole lot. I mean, they lost Abrams Drain, they lost Tyron Hopper, uh, Javon Foster, and then a couple other guys. Um, but overall, they're going to be easily replaced, I think. Uh, this this Missouri team has a ton of depth. They've got a lot of talent. Um, and I think they're finally at SEC caliber. So and uh, before you go and say, well, they, they competed for an SEC championship back in 2013, blah, blah, blah. That was, tw- that was 10 years ago. H- have they been good since the Pinkle era? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think Barry Odom did a fine job. I don't think he did a great job. He was fine. And then Drain was terrible his first couple of years. So, yeah, I think they're finally, you know, building into a proper SEC program. So, yeah. Anyway, let's talk the Royals now. All right, let's talk the Royals. Royals are four games above 500. That's a good thing. They're second in the division. That's a good thing. They're sitting pretty in the wild card race in, you know, late April. It's a good thing. Let me, let me preface what I'm about to say. Uh, With this, I think the Royals have every shot to make the playoffs this year. I think they have great cohesion, great chemistry. They have a lot of talent, and it's a young core that is eager to win for this city. What I do not like about the Royals, though, thus far, they are feasting on teams that are below 500. They've been just beating the crap out of teams that are below 500. What I don't like, however, is the fact that they're three and six against teams that are above 500. If you're going to be a playoff team, you have to win against good teams. And while I agree that it is early, that it is, you know, they're 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 going up against teams that are you know, mainstays in you know, major league major league baseball playoff races. Um, you gotta beat them to join them. In this case, and uh, what I see from the Royals is, you know. We get a lot of the, the the Royals get a lot of offense going. They they're really really strong when they want to be, but then they go on these cold streaks where it's like okay, you know, like we we have to get runs on the board, and just nothing ever happens. And it's not because of a good rotation. It's not because you know all oh, the Royals bats are terrible. It's because. I think they're getting a little bit too overconfident and they have to worry. And I think Matt Quattuaro has to adjust to where this young core can get learning experience against really good teams. But he has to also let them understand that, hey, like, this is a tough team that we're going up against. This is not, you know, the 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 White Sox. <laughs> that that we're going up against. This is this is a team that means business. This isn't a team that we can just smack balls all day on. This is a team that we'll have to strategize. We'll have to, you know, put guys where maybe they don't want to be. But I think the Royals are getting a bit too overconfident. And I think that's why they lost against the Orioles. Again, I still think that this is a team that could make a playoff run, but they have to know who they are first. I saw a comparison um, 
earlier on social media about how this Royals team is very similar to the 2013-2014 team where the where the guys kind of just were coming into their own and about to enter that era of really good Royals baseball but there were still cracks and I I I think that is a perfect example and a perfect comparison um Again, I think this team can make the playoffs. I think this team could go on a deep run if the climate is right. But you have to keep players like Bobby Witt Jr., Vinny Pascantino, Salvador Perez, MJ Melendez, and others consistent. I... I am so tired of watching Salvador Perez swing at pitches in the dirt. I agree that, you know, he can absolutely crank a down and a down and inside pitch, but he doesn't have to go golfing to find that. Have him work on his vision. I mean, and I get it, you know, he's a multi-year vet at this point, so you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but I mean, you gotta do something about that. It's a wasted bat. It's a wasted at bat. And then, you know, Bobby is doing great. Vinny's doing great. You have to stop the streakiness with MJ Melendez and the guys in between those guys, because when they're when Melendez and others are on. This team plays great. This team is one of the best teams in baseball. If, you know, the guys not named Bobby, Vinny, and Salvador are on their game, are on their A game. And uh, I don't know, just th this team still has growing to do, but I am excited about the growing that they're going to end up doing. Should Matt Cotrall play, play his cards right? Um, you know, this this is this is a team again that can win games. This is a team that can compete for the AL Central. They just need to realize what kind of team they are because they have the chemistry. Don't get me wrong, they just need to realize that hey, like these teams that have been mainstays in the in the AL playoff race, you know, they're, they're going to be playing good baseball and we need to adjust in game plan for that because not every team is going to be the Chicago White Sox. So um, let's go ahead and move on to the Chiefs because we got draft week to talk about. All right, let's talk the Chiefs. Let's talk draft week Thursday. April 25th, 25th <laughs> um, draft. The NFL draft is upon us. Um, draft is going to be in Detroit this year. So can't say you only got it for a year. Sad, but yeah, it was fun. Wish I could have gone, but you know, is what it is. Um Who are the Chiefs going to draft in the first round? That's a huge question that has been asked since we won the Super Bowl. Um, man, this is a tough decision because you need a wide receiver. You need an offensive tackle. You need uh, probably piece, a secondary piece. And then you need a tight end. And maybe a defensive lineman, too. I mean, Mike Dana's back, and I, I think Turk Wharton is, too. So that's not a huge need, I'd say. But it would still probably be good to pick up someone in, like, the middle to late rounds. Um, I've been seeing a lot of people saying that the Chiefs should trade up for Brock Bowers. I think that's really silly. I get it. You know, we're trying to find the Travis Kelsey replacement. 
Um, Travis Kelsey's getting up there in age. We need to find somebody to fill his shoes. I don't think we need Brock Bowers. I think Noah Gray is a great receiving tight end that just needs a chance. And I think if you put depth behind Gray, then you'll be good. And, and yeah, a guy that could potentially develop into the guy, a franchise tight end, like like Kelsey. Once Gray heads out, I, I think you can draft that in a later draft. And I get it, you know, well, Brock Bowers is this generational prospect and blah, 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 blah. I, I truly don't think the Chiefs are even thinking about that. I think they would have to give up too much to move up that far to get him. I, I think I think the Chiefs trade power in, in in regard to this draft can move them up into picks fifteen through twenty at best. I don't think they're moving into the top 10. I don't even think they're moving into 10 to 15 territory. I think 15 to 20 is the max amount they'll be able to move up because no one's going to give them that pick, that that, that top 15 pick. No one's going to do that. Like, wow, let's let's just help the rich get richer. There you go. And, unless the Chiefs are going to give up somebody that's – you know, a huge asset. Chief really can't afford to do that right now. So, yeah, I, I don't think the Chiefs trade up. I don't. Or trade up too far, I should say. Um, I think the Chiefs are either going to use that pick on a wide receiver or a tackle. Those are their two most pressing needs. I can see either or. And with the with how stacked this wide receiver, this wide receiver, um, I don't really know what to call it. Uh th- this wide receiver class is there we go. Um it, it it's I, I I would be very surprised. Kind of surprised. I wouldn't I won't say very. I would be somewhat surprised if they selected a wide receiver. Um, I, I kind of did some thinking, you know, in, in my first in my first mock draft, I had them taking a wide receiver. But then I thought of the guys that, you know, are in this draft. I mean, there are a group, there are at least 10 wide receivers that are first round material in this draft. There are 10 wide receivers that are at least first there are that are first round material in this draft. And I think even if you're worried about, say, like a guy like Xavier Leggett not falling to you, I am much more comfortable with trading up in the second round than I am trading up in the first. I think the Chiefs could easily get up into the early picks of the second round and get their guy. But as far as tackles go, there's there's talent. There's it's just not as deep as wide receivers are. So I I think the Chiefs go with the tackle um, with their first pick. I I can definitely see it. Um, as to who, that that's kind of up in the air. But you know, I could still see them picking a wide receiver, especially if a guy like Xavier Worthy is there or A.D. Mitchell. Um, really one of the two Texas guys. Maybe they reach a little bit on Leggett, but I doubt it. Um, but if those two guys... If, if those two, A.D. Mitchell and... Xavier Worthy, or if by some miracle of God, like Malik Neighbors or anybody like that is still on the board, 
I I think the Chiefs are just going to draft a tackle. Um, and then when it comes to the later rounds, you know, just do gap filling. Like I said, um, you know, fi- find that guy at corner, find that guy um, at all. It, it, and a guy that I really like, and not just because I'm a KU homer, a guy that I really like in this draft is Dominic Pooney. Uh, Pooney is a former offensive lineman for KU, and he played every single position while at KU. Um so I think he, he will fit in very nicely because of his pass blocking abilities, um, because he is just a guy that can play anywhere and be plugged in anywhere. I think he's I think he's kind of the Nick Allegretti replacement. Um and per- perhaps better than Allegretti. Um so overall I like him in the mid in the mid rounds. Um, I don't think he's going to be the first tackle that the Chiefs take per se, uh, but I I like him as a third round pick, and I can definitely see him as a third round pick. Um, as far as everywhere else, you know, it kind of remains the same as my first lock draft, just again, gap filling. So, um, you know, guys like Tyron Hopper, I can see getting drafted by the chiefs. I I like him at linebacker, um, as the Willie Gay replacement, uh, plays very similar to Willie Gay. Um, and you know, other than that, I'll have a mock draft out before, the draft is beginning. I'll probably have it out tomorrow, to be honest. So be on the lookout for that. It's draft season, folks. It's exciting times. Um, and then just in non-draft related news for the Chiefs, um, it's rumored that uh, Rashi Rice is out on bail, by the way. Uh, he, he was down practicing with Patrick Mahomes and company. Um earlier this week so no no real worry about that um what is the worry though is you know are there still going to be legal ramifications and what is the nfl going to do so uh, i have heard multi-game suspension at least um but we'll keep our ear to the ground regarding that uh for now let's move on to soccer and then we'll wrap up all right. Soccer. Let's talk soccer. Um, Casey Current are still undefeated. Haven't lost once. 5-2 victory over, I believe it was like Bay City, I think is what their name is. Um, big time. Huge, even. Uh, to see the ladies just running through competition. I mean, they are and these these games aren't close either like they're winning like five to two um i think earlier i saw three to one um these games are like two plus goal differential and that's huge um given how poor the offense was last year this is a huge improvement and to see them just absolutely rinse opponents and like to see them control possession, to see them, you know, making something out of a fast break or a transition um, is awesome to see because like I said, you know, the current are going to have to lean on their offense. Uh, Their defense, I don't think has made too many improvements, but the offense has improved so vastly that it doesn't matter. Um, it'll it'll matter once you know playoff time comes around. So hopefully the defense can shore up by then. But I mean, when you control possession as much as the current does, and when you capitalize on those you know mistakes that your opponent makes as much as the current does, 
you know, you can live off that for a good while. So kudos to the current for having, I believe it was named the best NWSL start in NWS, excuse me, um, in NWSL history. I think I read that somewhere, but you know, they they look really good. And if you haven't gone out to watch them, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great time. Um, I know my girlfriend and I are going to do our best uh, to get out to a game. I know that, you know, people were kind of spooked by that parking, um, that parking thing, because they just have limited space, essentially, is why they have to charge for parking. Um, but you know, it's an easy Uber. It's an easy, um, it's an easy carpool and there, it's a great time. Tickets are not that expensive. So go check out the new stadium, go check out this team because they are killing it compared to last year for sure. Um, and you hope that they can continue their dominance because they have been absolutely dominant this season. Um, as for Sporting KC, not what you love to see, but you know, it's fine. I can't believe that they gave up that goal to allow St. Louis to draw after you came back, no less, and allowed them to draw. Oh, I just want to shut them up. Seriously. I mean, I get it. You know, Sporting Casey's defense is not spectacular, but that was way too easy, uh, especially for at that time with, you know, extra time, just extra time remaining. And you allow that, I mean, that made me so angry because you had him beat. I mean, you really did. Um, as far as week before goes with Messi and losing 3-2 at Arrowhead, that doesn't matter nearly as much, in my opinion. Um, you had to beat your in-state rivals. You had to. Um, and, you know, all this talk about, oh, well, Messi's – so great and messy is this, messy is that. You know, cool. You got the fourth most attendance all time in, for an MLS game. You, you still got to win games, guys. You're still competing for, you know, a profession. You still got to win games. Like, you can't just, you know, sit and lay back on your laurels especially when you didn't win anything one. So, so in the grand scheme of things, like as far as this season goes, who cares about Messi? Who cares? You, you got to win games when they're winnable and put opponents away. That's the struggle that I've seen with Sporting KC is they'll get up on an opponent, but can't put them away. And it's it's really disheartening to see because this is a good soccer team. Peter Vermees has a good young team on his hands that is moldable, that is in you know, that can be in top form at any given moment and can go on a great run, just like last year. But they have to win these games that are plenty winnable and that they put themselves in a position to win. And it's disheartening that they haven't. So you hope that changes. I think with Vermees, you know, you weren't going to see that change, but it's just a matter of when. So uh, let's, let's go ahead and wrap up. I don't really have much to talk about anymore. So let's go ahead and wrap up. All right. That's our show. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this little adventure that we have every week. Um, got a little bit of minor news. Um, Casey Blues start their sevens journey uh, this upcoming 
or no, not this Thursday, but Thursday after uh, will be the start of uh, Summer 7's practice. Um, so if you're an athlete and are really good at being fast and shifty and, you know, can make cuts and do everything that I can't um, to, to a greater degree than I can at least, um, check it out. Um, should be a good sevens, should be a good sevens program this year. Um, but yeah, that's our show. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been the Burn KC signing off. Have a great night.